Tale of Anthony Bell, a hunting ballad by Alfred Munnings. The frost is keen and sparrows unseen are fighting amongst the holly. The hunting is stopped and the wintry sun has tried to thaw where the currents run in the brook by Steepleton Folly. It begins to blow and flakes of snow are spitting upon the fire. So, sporting children, gather around. I'll tell you a story of horse and hound and the ways of a hunting squire. Now, Anthony Bell, of whom I tell, was always hunting foxes. He lived at a place called Highfield Hall. His horses were standing in every stall. There were horses in all the boxes. There were browns and bays and wonderful greys, for greys were his rule and passion. And though he had never a guinea to spare, he paid 300 at Horncastle Fair for a dapple grey mare called Fashion. In kennels dry his hounds did lie, all of them fit for going. They found a fox and followed his line, be it ever so wet or ever so fine, or the hardest gale were blowing. His whips and all were hung in the hall. There were hunting horns on the tables. His boots and trees, they stood on the floor. And there on a peg, on a green baize door, was a coat he wore in the stables. When his temper boiled, he was petted and spoiled by a wife and three good daughters. If he happened to meet with a serious fall, they made up a bed in the dining hall and sent for old Dr. Waters. Like a huntsman born, he could wind his horn, and never a man dared flight him. Many were those who did rejoice at the sound of his rich, melodious voice when he rallied his hounds about him. The squire's first whip was Daniel Ship, as keen on a hunt as a spaniel. The second whip, Tom, could view a fox from Ashton Hill to Clinton Rocks. He was second to none but Daniel. For miles around, good sport they found on every day but Sunday. They hunted as long as the day was light, and they all finished up on Saturday night and started afresh on Monday. Now Highfield Hall had chimneys tall. There were ancient elms about it. In one of its rooms, a ghost did walk. For years it had always been the talk, and nobody seemed to doubt it. In Highfield Park, when nights were dark, the ghost would walk the valley. One frosty night, when the moon shone bright, the squire and Daniel followed its flight the length of the yew tree alley. But ghosts of the, of the dead never bothered his head, a hardened and tough old sinner. To keep up his hunting, he'd pinch and screw. His wife and his daughters, they made the stew, and a groom brought in the dinner. He returned one day from far away, his face with the wind was ruddy. He'd had such a hunt. His coat was torn, he'd lost a spur, he'd lost, lost his horn. His breeches and boots were muddy. He called for a drink and changed his pink for a seedy old coat worn thinner. They brought him his slippers, they brought him the jack. He pulled off his boots, he was glad to be back. And then he sat down to dinner. At half past nine he had finished his wine. At ten he began to snore. At twelve, he was still in his grandfather's chair, dreaming he rode on the dapple grey mare, when somebody tapped at the door. By a brandy flask, a fox's mask was hanging below the ceiling. It began to yawn at the dying fire, then winked an eye at the sleeping squire, and the shadows around were stealing. The fox's snout, it moved about, and loud became the tapping. The fox began to howl and bark. The fire died down. The room turned dark. Still louder grew the rapping. A thundering stroke, and the squire awoke. He was drowsy, 
and sore and sleepy. From the shadows above, the fox still winked at him in his chair as he sat and blinked, and Anthony Bell felt creepy. The noise at the door grew more and more. His knees and his legs were shaky. On a sudden, the door was opened wide to a ghostly figure that stepped inside, and Anthony Bell grew quaky. With arms outspread, the ghost then said, I come to bring you sorrow, for when I appear to one of the bells, as sure as their ancient legend tells, he then must die on the morrow. The eyes turned red in the fox's head as it wickedly leered in the stillness, and Anthony Bell, he, he drew a breath. In what sort of way shall I come by death? I sure won't die of an illness. He began to stamp and rave and ramp. And the ghost replied, Beware, tomorrow you'll come to the boundary wall and meet your fate in a fearful fall though you ride your dapple grey mare. Up rose the squire with his eyes afire and roared at as, as the ghost was speaking. I'll put my trust in the dapple grey mare. I shan't be killed, and I won't beware if I ride to the sides of Regan. His anger grew, and he hurled a shoe where the ghostly shade was sinking. But the ghost was fled, and he flung instead his hunting boots at the fox's head. Roared he, that will stop thy winking. He stood by the door and cursed and swore at thought of the ghostly warning. Said he, I fear no boundary wall. I'll ride the grey, and whate'er befall, she shall carry me up in the morning. The light was low from the dying glow of a candle near in its socket, and he blew his nose in great relief with a yellow and crimson handkerchief which he pulled from his coat-tail pocket. With cautious tread, he went to bed and soundly slept till morning. He was up and dressed by seven o'clock, as bright as a beam, as firm as a rock, in spite of his ghostly warning. The meet that day was not far away. The sun shone bright and clearly. He took his hounds to the cover side and hummed a tune as he sat astride the grey which he loved so dearly. He brushed from her neck a, a white foam flick. He tightened the girths down under. My dear, said he, I will go today, and if only our fox runs Morton way, we will have that wall by thunder. He threw in his hounds at the lower bounds of the Denton Long Plantation, and soon, with a straining, eager dash, they were rousing the cover with a crash, and each rider took up his station. The fox broke cover down the wind and every, every hound was speaking. There then began such a famous run, the finest run that ever was begun, each rider his own line seeking. From the vale below came a loud hello from old fat farmer Jolly, who vooed the fox as he crossed the lane. Then over the brook he was seen again, heading for Steepleton Folly. They saw the gleam of the Langton stream and went for a bridge up higher. The squire sent on the dapple grey mare and she flew the brook for the yard to spare. Begad, he said, what a flyer. From Langton Brook, their line they took from Steepleton on to Rigby. And close to his hounds rode Anthony Bell. When the tail of the hunt were at Croxton Dell, the squire was on through Digby. At Cold Ash Green, poor Tom was seen down at his head at a double. Near Thorndon Hall, though riding light, a post and rail stopped Daniel's fight, flight and laid him out in a stubble. Three fields ahead, brave Reynard sped. The hunt was then fast thinning. What a juice of a run, said Anthony Bell. When I get home, 
What a tale I'll tell. And the fox, he looked like winning. For Morton Dale, if he didn't fail, he was saving his strength and cunning. Six riders were there who had seen the start. The squire still taking the leading part. There never was known such running. He steadied the grey as they led the way. It was here that he meant to prove her. For right ahead was the boundary wall. All roughly laid and wide and tall. With the tail hounds streaming over. And he cursed the hosts of all the ghosts. As he, read for, as he rode for his reputation, said he, I can fall as well as ride. And he swore that he'd get to the other side if it landed him in damnation. And straight at the wall he rode for a fall. And the grey rolled over her master, and pale as a corpse he lay as he fell on the sodden wet ground. Brave Anthony Bell, who had challenged foretold disaster. When Daniel came, he lay the same, as still as a man that slumbered. A farmer brought back the dapple grey mare and talked to Dan with a stony stare that squire's days were numbered. And Dan said, no, it couldn't be so. He'd lay him a golden guinea. And then, with the help of ploughboys strong, the squire on a gate, was borne along from that spot by Morton Spinney. They carried him slow to a farm below. They sent for Dr. Waters. And Daniel returned to Highfield Hall and broke the news of the squire's fall to his master's wife and daughters. They hurried away where the squire lay, all of them pale and crying. And they found him upstairs in a four-posted bed a little bit dazed and light in the head, but a very long way from dying. He'll never be dead, the doctor said, with six days a week in the saddle. If people all lived as hard as he, they'd be just as hard as hard could be and never a brain would addle. In a week he was well, was Anthony Bell, and sitting in Highfield Hall. His wife and his daughters were turn and pale as he got to the end of his wonderful tale of the ghost and the boundary wall. And now, said he, I am going to see the chamber they say is haunted. And he strewed upstairs to the second floor. He burst wide open the sealed up door and entered the room undaunted. And called up Dan and every man and all the boys in the stables. They turned the closets inside out. They searched the house and all about from the cellar floor to the gables. In a cellar base and burgundy lay, which the squire had long forgotten. With many a whoop and call, they searched in the attics, above where sparrows perched on the rafters, old and rotten. High overhead went their noisy tread. The squire was down in the spare room when he came on a spring in a panelled door and discovered a chamber, unknown before, containing a family heirloom. For a chest stood there in the chamber bare, worm-eaten, old and crazy. He broke the locks with blows and knocks. He opened the lid of that ancient box. For a moment, his brain was hazy. Not heeding the noise of the stable boys, the squire was lost in wonder. He was handling guineas and bags of gold, necklaces, deeds and parchments old, like a pirate king with his plunder. For his wife he bawled, his daughters were called, they should each have a silken gown. He'd buy them a chaise, a chaise and pair, to drive abroad and take the air. They should drive to London town. And the burgundy came with its ruby flame. The squire, he roared with pleasure. He trod on the tail of his favourite hound. He opened a bottle and sent it round. And they drank success to the treasure. And it all came true, did that treasure new, when they sent for lawyer Berry. And after the deeds had all been sought, the parson came in and they started the port. There was never a night so merry. 
They revelled all night with the diamonds bright spread in a gleaming litter. They counted the gold until the dawn, and necklaces once again were worn all in a blazing glitter. For weeks after that, the lawyers sat in their chambers, dim and dusty, with search and eye and cautious heed, they studied the lines of each ancient deed enrolled in those parchments musty. And the parchments old produced their gold. Two footmen stood at the door. Each lady was wearing a silken gown. They made a long journey to London town and they rode in a chaise and four. But the squire of fame remained the same. He started to hunt on Mondays and he finished up late each Saturday night. But his wife and his daughters, they claimed the right to take him to church on Sundays. <laughs>